welcome. So we are again looking at the component testing, which is part of the model from Enterprise UI Development, a course taught by Steve Kinney, head fronting engineer at Temporal. Uh, and let's go to jump straight forward to this, right? So after all, this component testing is all about to gain confidence in your UI development without having to get a full browser-driven integration. Why that is important? Because at the end of the day, spin up a server from the scratch, every time you want to actually test your UI components, is something that is expensive. Not to mention that there is a lot of things that you need to simulate. Uh, for example, the several browsers that you're gonna, that the, that the user, uh, that your users are expect to use, whether it's Firefox, Chrome, or uh, Safari, or all of these hipster browsers like Brave, right? Uh, also, the way uh, of how your users going to interact with your API, with the network interface. So are they coming from a 2G or a 3G or 4G? Uh, in which OS they run in that particular browser? You know, so but the point of this is to now have this nice little environment and wrapper around your UI components so we can now is query elements, uh, not only DOM elements, but also is a UI elements in a very convenient way and also in, interact with your component similar to the way that your end users will do. And that is, well, by providing is another wrapper with the, uh, for example, uh, the typings uh, or key up, uh, scroll and all that kind of stuff, right? Some common behaviors uh, that your user expect to go as once they interact with any of these UI components. So this is a very interesting thing because uh, similar to uh, React, that after all React is a wrapper around the DOM that expose certain functionalities so we can now compose UI elements in a very interesting way. Uh, and also it has its own trade-off. Uh, now, and the same for Jest, uh, which is now have this particular API that is, uh, that is, that wraps around is, um, well, it's, it's this a, a expected or assertion API to actually check that a function do what it's supposed to do, to functions and objects, right? Uh, now here, this testing library, which is one of the tools that we're gonna use, uh, is a nice little wrapper around, it can be your DOM elements or your UI components, or UI framework components, whether it's Angular, React, Marco, uh, Preach, and all of these kind of frameworks, right? Uh, that's, this is the TLDR of, the, of doing this component testing. Uh, and the main value of tests is that you continuously um, have you your confidence. What you can to talk in other ways is like the main value of tests is you continuously making sure that your you're continuously making sure that your <coughs> sorry. So you're continuously making sure that things don't break behind your behind your back. A very, very, very important here. That's why I put it here. It's like you can make sure that is uh, true, all right? Or you can now have more confidence by having this uh, test that you continuously making sure that your that uh, you can you can make sure that that thing. Uh, don't break behind your back. So, because of that, 
uh, I look at how can we now write our component tests for small little things, so for example, like the a simple counter, uh, and for more complex stuff like a rendering list of elements, okay, and adding list of elements and removing list of elements, which is a very common thing that you're gonna do, rendering list of elements. Uh, the most common thing that we're gonna do as UI developers is like filling form or designing forms and lists, all right? Uh, and one of the main value proposition of forms or the component testing is for form validation. So you can make sure that all of the things that you are putting there actually were as expected, which is a great thing. Uh, and in the context of rendering elements, like a list, okay, that usually that data come from some external source. So for example, it can be come from your server, right? You need to find a way to store that and manage that. So usually you do that using a, something called Redux, this store management uh, or this state management uh, library. Because of that, and when you are, for example, now are testing these kind of components, list of components, that now uh, you wanna say, hey, when I, do, when I click here, let me actually show you uh, an example here. So you can understand what am I talking here, <laughs> you know? Do, do, do. Let me, in fact, is npm run dev, uh, npm start, okay, you got it? All right, so, um, so the thing here is that, hey, we're gonna take a look now at showing 10 elements and all that kind of stuff. Uh, is, um, increment or reset, uh, search or vivia, oh vivia, hmm, interesting, uh, but in any case, um, for example here in our packaging list, which is something that we commonly use here, we, we render elements here, uh, so we add let's say a Mac, Macbook, MacBook, MacBook Pro, right, MacBook Pro. So we add these elements and we add this. So we want to now check this particular behavior. Uh, and not only that, by the time we click here, we actually check that it's showing in the proper render list, package item or package items here. This is when things are starting to get a little bit interesting. Why is that? Because all of this state, this data, that is being handled now by JavaScript using the main memory. Here, let's say, hey, iPhone, iPhone 16, right? By the time we add this here, we also now is handling or using is the implementation or the functionality behind the scenes to actually add items, all that kind of stuff. So. As I, as I mentioned before, because most of the time when we need to handle this particular state, okay, we use is now a store, all right, or we put our state into some place where we can have access through, and that is using providers, this context API, uh, or we can use this Redux. So the whole point of this is to say, all right, uh, Let's now to evaluate is the yeah. Let's now to yeah. Let's now to evaluate is um, how these items are being showing here, right? And because we are now testing is a inner functionality here, a functionality that is from the component this this state, um, this is when thing, when this is when you ask yourself is like, hey, uh, if I starting, because I want to, I want to test this other component, 
but because this component now depends on some external data, okay, for example, the providers, and now let's take a look at the code here, okay, mm -mm -mm -mm. that's right, the providers, do, 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 what it is, uh, here, all right, so now that we uh, get into the new items, we say, hey, I'm dispatching this using a custom hooks. Uh, you may wonder, hey, where does custom hook come from? Uh, all right, and I'm telling you that this is coming from the use Redux uh, dispatch, right? So um, this is just custom hooks uh, that actually following, that, that follow is the Flux architecture uh, that you have now in a state and a reducer that is from read the reducer is going to now generate a new state uh, out of that. So you can uh, present, show that on the view. Uh, and for any other interaction that happened, you call that action, trigger the reducer, and so on and so forth. So, um, but because we have this, and in this particular case, uh, as you can see behind the scenes, we are using is now selectors uh, as a way to now uh, get access to this particular store, this particular uh, Redux API, which is an object, okay? Uh, in fact, a Redux is a monad, a, not in the strict term, but a monad, and this is a concept from the functional programming that I'm going to describe that in terms of functionality, uh, which is this allow, this is a way to model is the state change. Uh, and this is powerful here. So, um, <clears throat> but in any case, uh, what is relevant here is that, as you can see here, uh, we are using is now the React Redux, all right? Uh, not the React RTK, okay? Which is just another wrapper that provides more convenient uh, functionality uh, to common tedious task. So for example, create now an action object and then from there is uh, uh, generate is uh, create the actions uh, and also, uh, when it comes to provide TypeScript support, it's much more friendly to do that. And it, it requires less ceremony to set up the actions. Uh, you can now, um, yeah, it requires less ceremony to implement your actions. Uh, also, um, you can now is it provide more it provide better TypeScript support, and it make much more easy to add middlewares or to enhance the store, uh, which is something that you have to is it, something that you need to actually uh, back in the old days to Google it and understand how you wire up things to do that. Uh, so okay, um, but here we are. <laughs> Okay, here we are, the application state and the items. So, um, because of this functionality that is highly coupling to this, uh, as you can see here, uh, that is highly coupling, that is highly coupling to these components, this is when it is important to now isolate or abstract the UI from the business logic. How can you do that for your tests? Once, again, test isolations. So one way to do that is to say, hey, every time that I want to run my component test, I would like to now have every, a, a setup object here. So I have to, I, I, like, I would like to have the basic installation needed, okay? when I run this particular test. So, because of components, anytime we call that, it will create now a new one, you know? This is, this is, this is part of the functional uh, programming concept called purity. So, one input, one single output, all right? It doesn't uh, perform some side, of, uh, side effects. Uh, 
unlike here, we are doing is this side effect. Uh, and because of that, we need to now take a look at that place where we are performing the side effects and now generate is now a factory here, a new object here that we can now use every time we want to uh, we want to test this uh, particular component this particular process of wrapping a component with its own provider it is a pattern but in itself because this is something that you're going to do a lot you know we're talking now about is this another distraction here in this case um, because now this new item uh, use uh, this dispatch, uh, all right? Uh, and you may wonder, hey, what is this dispatch? Hey, it comes from the store. Uh, and you want to say, hey, all right, but uh, is this a store? Uh, who make use this store? <laughs> you know, who actually are using this particular store? Uh, which is called the application dispatch is using use reducer who actually is using that oh my god no what what the french toast what do you, what do you think you're doing For real? Hey, 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 no. Oh, I, I think I don't have, I don't have that enabled? Mm hmm Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. No, I, I didn't have enabled that. You think you're funny? Uh, there is this one. Okay, rectangle. Good. Come here. Uh, so yeah, th there is uh, a very valid and interesting question: is that who actually is making use of this, right? As you can see, we are importing is this item called from this item slice. If we can dive deep into this. We say, oh. Um, this item slice, which is now a way of how Redux actually is, uh, have, again, this name convention is something that is quite hard, but this slide is now a particular state that you want to add to their app level state, right? So here uh, we're saying, hey, this, is, this will be this initial state, right? That'll be a string and an item, okay? Uh, and then we got all of our redusters, so all of our action that we can act accordingly, right? So we are exporting is the item slicer redusters, okay, as well as the actions. That's good. Uh, however, from the code itself, you want to know is who is using this. You want to make sure who actually is making use of this. Uh, especially on the uh, so one way to, to check at that uh, is by using now the dev tool here you say hey um, let me take a look now at the dev tool uh, by going back to the code I mean by going back to the browser here uh, inspect this and say hey uh, let me ins let me inspect that all right let me take a look at the component here, right? Uh, especially here, the task list, all right? And how if I go in here, it actually going to highlight me is that it's a, hey, here in this frame, where you're going to render of all elements, we're using now a provider, right? So we say, hey, okay, where this provider are coming from? Uh, React.redoster. From their new list, you can say package list. Okay, so this is the component that actually is uh, now uh, getting to. 
One of the cool things of view is that we can now inspect the matching down, uh, log this component data to console, is that we can now, this is just a way to take a look at the element, which is a good thing. Uh, but what if I want to now uh, because one of the great thing of uh, component span always parse hook name is that uh, with view three we have now this nice little functionality that anytime we click here it will now take us to the uh, component in our code. But in any case, it's packaging list, right? We can see that this is packaging list, okay? Uh, so when we go back to our code here, and here, da -da -da, all right? And then we say, okay, who is packaging list, right? Where is packaging list? Packaging, packaging list. Packaging, packing, packing, oh my god, packing <laughs> list. All right, what is that component? Packing list. All right, so okay, this is packing list. Uh, it is called here, this is on the packet list. Uh, you can now have is the index, right? So uh, here is when you say, hey, we have these things called provider. And if you remember what provider does, okay, it gives us a way to now is give out the store. But this store is when the functionality uh, lies. So one of the interesting things, especially when you're testing your component that depend or that interact with an app, with an app level state, okay, is that uh, you are also testing that functionality. So here, uh, we need to actually say, hey, if we are not all, if we are, if we're not only testing the components uh, UI, but also is the the logic from all of these particular plays that it interact to, in this case, our store, we need to actually find a way to create something new out of that. So create a new store from that. In this case, this might be true not only for this React components, but also for any other uh, functionality. For example, in the case of View 3, when you want to now um, mimic this kind of behavior, right? So we can ask now here to ChatGPT or Claw to see if we don't actually lose our mind. Okay, for example, in the case of Claw, and the uh, da, 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 example list, packaging list, right? So you get is with perplexity as well, you know? You say, hey, perplexity, huh? tell me something. And so what am I? Okay, so when testing when testing component, it is safe to assume that create a setup uh, create a setup. Create a setup object. Yeah, when testing component, it is safe to assume that create. It is safe to assume that we need to create setup objects not only for our our uh, inner state, but for our app level state. For example, React component, React component, and 
if that is using Redux, exactly, React Component, React Component using Redux, View Component uh, using Pinia, please provide an example with a angular and is belt because in the context of angular is say hey I'm going to create now this this is when I'm gonna define is the interactivity and all of this life cycle, right? Uh, and it is interesting because it's also using is this particular behavior and getting store the dispatch and stuff like that. Uh, and now in your component, you say, hey, uh, let me define as a user list component, the component fixture, okay? Uh, and the store and the mock store. So you mock is the initial state, you know? Uh, and then you run your test. They're using is not test bed, which is Angular Core 10, but again, it's quite the same. Uh, again, this is very specific to Angular, where you have to now say declarations, providers, and compile options. Okay. Uh, and before you're running your test, you say, hey, I want you to now uh, test, I want to make the store be this. To, in, to inject with this initial state, okay. Uh, and the other is the fixture to the create components uh, and the component with fixture the component instance. So now this is when you start into actually is the running or the test. Hey, you should dispatch low users on init, uh, the tag change. And I expect dispatch spies to have been called with low users. Uh, with low users and where the French does you define low users uh, anyway it's a method uh, it should show user from a store mock users so you send that to the store uh, and that kind of stuff a uh, fixture to the text change and uh, fixture dot native element query selectors oh, okay this fixture is uh, Components fixtures. Oh, okay, some sort of wrapper around this. Mm, Angular core testing. Okay, this is now like the render component. Okay, again, this is a little, nice little wrapper uh, that exposed is uh, this API that you can now query elements and interact with them from the user perspective. Okay, but but that, but as you can see here, this is on as well. Uh, when you write this, and this is your user list uh, svelte, you want to import that, uh, mount to load the users, and each user as, then you do this, and then when, you can, when it comes to run your test, you say, hey, before each, again, you use now testing library, okay? Here is when you define your before each, you mock that, store, all right, and it should load and display users on mount. So this is when you say, hey, uh, find all by text, which is a good, a good thing. Uh, or you can also is say is using the screen because this is also useful uh, for debugging. Okay, way for users to be loaded. Exactly, find all uh, by text. This is not a specific uh, query element that actually take time to it is based on promise. Uh, user have to lend. Uh, uh, user element uh, to have the text content of John. Should update select users when clicking the uh, select button. So it use fire events. But in our case, we perhaps we might uh, we prefer to use now this wrapper of the user event. Okay. 
to do that, select button, find all text which is select. In our case, we now uh, can, we can find buttons here is by row, okay? And after that, I want to now uh, clear all the mocks. Again, this is, this is just to inspect the behavior, okay, that we are using. Let me actually, instead of saying this, uh, let me just uh, ask the question again, but without providing any example. You make a good point about testing components that rely on application level state management. Let me create a comprehensible guide to demonstrate this pattern for component connected to different state management solutions. So, mm -mm. so anytime we want to test something, all right, uh, if you want to test that and that in that component that is testing now relies on other stuff. Perhaps it's re is perhaps it is it triggers some again is your components now are tightly coupling to other models it can be a, a state management it can be a API request okay a server uh, but any time to do that you make a good point of, uh, about testing components that rely on application state. Uh, what what will be the name of this pattern? Test setup provider pattern. It follows the broader provider pattern concept, but specifically for testing context. Mm -hmm. But this is now a test set of provider pattern. You know, and this is one of the interesting things here, because any time, and again, I want to go back a little bit to describe this, uh, which is now the basic installations needed to run our test, which is here, all right? So anytime that you are now in your testing, or in your uh, build step, or uh, running this static analysis, and then you define all of this process on top of that, process like, hey, go review uh, the signed documents or blueprints, and as you do this kind of stuff, you're going to find out is repetitive stuff, patterns. For example, here like this uh, that, we, that we found, uh, or well, actually, that Steve Keeney mentioned, right? So this is now called the test setup provider pattern. Mm -hmm. Using test using test setup methods. Configure yes, provider better pattern and unit testing. For that, uh, writable provider. Test, unit testing pattern, common to follow testing pattern, right? Running test construct with data provider. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, uh, test provider pattern. Mm -hmm. Let me define the provider pattern here, which is a very interesting stuff. which is a very interesting stuff. Building a fishing floater app with block pattern, implementation advantage of it practice. Again, all of these patterns, right, is just way to now make sure, okay, talk is cheap, show me the code. <laughs> Um, wait, what? Oh, hell no. Um, 
Anyway, anyway um, but this is interesting because now it, it developed this particular pattern. So, quite, 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 quite interesting here. So, when you're running your test in isolation, the, um, mm -hmm, the test, uh, the test provider pattern is just a way to make your life much more simple when it comes to test now components, very, very, very specific. When it comes to test now UI components uh, that rely on third or that it needs to, that, that, that perform side effects, okay, which is now communicate to external store or to external sources. It can be now uh, a state management, it can be now an API, a local database, and an animation. So when your component started to do that, which is something that eventually it will ha it will happen, okay, at some point. Uh, now, one of the way to actually test that, especially with the app level state, is with the provider. This is just for one particular uh, topic here. Okay. So, by the time your component uh, interact with an external, with an external, with an external source, for example, mm -hmm. so by the time your component interact with an external source, for example, a, in, for example, an app level state management which is Redux, Pinia, you name it, right? Uh, it is useful to use uh, the, the provider pattern. It is useful, uh, it is useful, it is useful uh, or yeah it is useful to go to go with the uh, test provider pattern in other words in other words create functions for a clean state okay, or for to create functions for from an initial state Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, in other words, provide functions, create functions for an initial state when running your UI components. So this is something interesting here. So because most code bases start falling apart through a relatively series of reasonable hacks and shortcuts hmm because no one wants to sit there and then uh, they are uh, at the end of the week uh, and they just want us to just ship this stuff and uh, uh, get over it you know uh, just to get the job done right things to get your job done but over time it adds up uh, and ends up in the point where you don't trust uh, anything there. And that's something that is not great, uh, especially if you have now this UI development. So, uh, but is this. So that now, let's take a look at this uh, theme here uh, to do that, right? So now that we talk about testing isolation. So um, here we say, hey, uh, this is another test scope, right? This is another test scope. All right. Like this. This is a testing project. 
Mm -hmm. Intestine isolation. And here you have now the pattern uh, test provider pattern. Again, this is a specific to React. To exactly. Separation of concern. Mm -hmm. Test provider pattern. In other words, separation, separation of concerns between the UI component. Okay. Separation of concern between the UI component and the business logic. Mm -hmm. Let's get into this. What in the French toast is this, bro? No, it's to extract uh, that. This component from the utilization provider. Right? So that I can swap out any different provider and it'll just work within my like, business layer. Um, and you know, we could take them really far if we wanted to, we probably won't. Uh, but there are a bunch of things we can do. Um, and like some of these are just kind of useful patterns, right? Like I mean it doesn't need to be but like um, if you think about Redux kind of like via the hook, you had like those higher order components where you would have like a system view layer only version of the component. more testability in the vocabulary maintainability No, but we can do is just to in that component is to wrap that. No, but I see that this particular pattern here is that you have not your component and a wrapper with the provider. In this case, for this specific case. Uh, but here we are with a 
And if you don't exactly, and if you don't even have unit that would even even notice that the issue here. <laughs> So let's go to unwind this. Well, I will call this. So this is not return is the provider with the packaging list. Mm -hmm. And then the packaging list. All right. And I want to both of them explore that. React component here. So I can use children here to render this list of element. He's going to exp export the application, export the packaging list, because having a version of this so this is something great because now you can make use of this component in isolation. So you can, so you can, exactly, you can, you can use this component to test in isolation and with the state management, which is this data that it depends on. Also, the application. Packaging list. You're gonna throw. You're gonna throw an error. We say, hey, hey. I internally, I'm calling to this. Yep, that is true. I don't, I don't know. I do not have a provider. Export the provider. I do not have. Do you know what I'm going to recreate at that point? My original one. Right, because then I will still have one with the store in closing state, and I will also be back where I started with a slightly more modular component, like better than when I started, but with the same issue. Uh, so let's not deal with that just yet. Um, so one of the cool things about uh, React testing library is that you can, you know, uh, I could do something where I, you know, I do this like rapid, like I can pull out a provider. Yeah, you can wrap it, say, this into now with the store. We're just creating now a new state from the store, from that. Mm -hmm. It's in closure state. is to create a new one for the store. And anytime we call it, we get that access. I gain a lot here for just four lines of go, man. Uh, 
so we could go ahead and let's let's say for instance we're gonna do we're gonna do this test right now as an only test because the cache is gonna run at least we have a, a cache one element wide open at all times for the first three. Okay. Uh, uh cooler fails, same reason fails before, it's not a provider. Exactly it's not a provider. So we can say is that hey provider, provider. all right where now here uh, you say hey let's go to get this provider all right and let's go to pass now this store here which is the state here which creates store as a function call it Just create a function here inside of this render, like that. Right. right. Um, Let's do this move. <laughs> Let's do this move, bro. <laughs> Let's do this move, bro. Let's do this move. Bro. I messed it up. Let's do this move, bro. Let me set it up. Let me do this for me, bro. Render with provider. <laughs> Let's do this move, bro. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. React element. Uh, and well, we're going to return is the uh, render. We're gonna, exactly, we're gonna return is the provider. Exactly. With that, why is this? Because this render provider is now actually is a wrapper of this UI component that now not only going to expose is the query methods, the down query methods, uh, and for the testing library, but also is the user events or the user interactions for that. Unless you define that. In this case, it will work. You say as render, swap this here with this render here. Exactly. This no. Why not? It's a get by level tags. That one, that one render. Uh, screen get by. Are we not exporting render? And I will render here. So we're calling it this render and calling is render. Yeah, but it's like the screen will get by label text. Emoji and a name and a role. We'll scream about the emoji. 
That is so true. Not true for labels, right? Which are actually not in the test, but two options here. And honestly, they, they both go into the, like the what you should probably have in your test. A little more flexibility. Like you want your like when your test breaks, you want them to break for a really good reason, not because someone put in an emoji in UI. Because like <laughs> next time the designer goes on PTO, I'm gonna put some emojis in UI. Not because someone. <laughs> Next time the time go in the PTO, post stress. Oh my God, PTO, PTO. Uh, meaning, I think it's post. Uh, oh, P okay, pay time off. Next time the time go PTO. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So render here, it'll be now a type of render. Okay. All right. Of this little function. Uh, and here you have now the components and the options here. When you now call this store and this wrapper that if you want to make use of this, uh, which is now, hey, this will be a component prop with children's. What you're gonna now pass is this provider with the children that is gonna be rendered here, right? So this children that is gonna be rendered, okay, it'll be the component. So by the time you call the render here, you are saying, hey, this will accept now the component, uh, which is uh, the component that I'm passing here. Okay, in this case, packaging list um, with the options of the wrapper. Okay. Let, let me see this uh, uh, briefly, bro. Uh, because this is coming from the render. Okay, okay. This is something that comes from the render. So you have now the render, the render testing library okay library all right testing render testing library with react okay especially with the api when you have now the render okay which as would accept is the ui as follow the options here you will often use this expense to see below uh, and render options here like this you will often need to specify option but if you do but if you ever do here are the available options which you could provide are a second argument to render the container by default oh, okay by default react testing library will create diff and append the diff to the document that body and this is where your react component will be rendered if you provide your own HTML container via this option, it will not be appended to the documental body automatically. For example, if you're unit testing, uh, if you're unit testing a table body uh, element, it cannot be a child of the this in this case. So you can specify a table as the render component. Again, part of the option. Because by default, it's using now a diff to actually mount this component in this a uh, um, DOM implementation uh, in this Node.js DOM implementation, all right. So it put now a div, and as you can see in your test, actually that's what it's doing. Uh, follow me along with this for a moment, okay? Um, as you can see here, all right look at this it put a div here uh come on here for a second uh this is to throw an error but what it's doing is that hey i'm going to now 
by the time that I'm going to render this component, I'm going to put a diff and then render the, the React component. All right. However, for example, for some specific use cases, when you are testing a table uh, that it follow a particular structure, that's when you need to pass is the container. So, so far, so good, right? This is passing the container. You also have things like base element. If the container is specified, then this def then this defaults to that. Otherwise, it, this defaults to the document of body. This is used as a base element for the query, as well as what is printed when you use when you use the box. Hydratate. If hydratate is set to true, then it will render with React DOM hydratate. This React DOM hydratate is a way to provide now interactivity to this or to attach functionality to HTML if I if I call that great hydrate hydrate react no dumb no and the callback call hydrate in react 17 and below to attach to attach react to an existing HTML that has already rendered by react in a server environment oh that attach Okay, that attach React to an existing HTML element that has that was already rendered by React in a server in a server environment. So this HTML element that was rendered by React uh, in a server environment, you attach React. But what is specifically what you are attaching? React will attach to the HTML that exists inside of the DOM node. And take over managing the DOM inside of it and apply fully build with and apply fully build with React will usually once have uh, would usually only have one hydrate go with this root component. The React node, the React node used to render the existing HTML. This will use this uh, this will usually be a piece of GSX which was rendered with React DOM server methods, such as render to a stream. Oh, okay, but this is now in server side of environments. Render to a stream in React 17. DOM node is say, hey, a DOM element that was rendering as the root element on the server. Okay. An optional callback. A DOM, no, a DOM element that was rendered as the root element on the server. Oh, this is rendered as the root element of the server. And then the optional, the callback. A function, if pass, React will call it after your component is hydrate. Hydrate, but this is, mm, this is in server side. Call hydrate to attach a React component into a server render browser DOM node. What does it mean this? <laughs> because we're getting here into hydrate option. Okay. Um, attach. But when they say attach, oh, this is deprecated. In React 18, hydrate was replaced by hydrate root. Using Hydrate in React 18 will warn that your app will behave as if it is run in React 17. Uh, this API will remove in future major versions. Again, but now you have Hydrate root. Let you display React components inside a browser DOM node whose HTML content was previously generated by React DOM server. So if this content was previously generated by React DOM server, okay? Now, uh, lets you display React components inside of the browser DOM. Oh, mm -hmm. Question. Uh, hydrate. Let you display React components inside of the a browser DOM node whose HTML can 
lets you display React components inside of a browser DOM node. So I can display them components inside of a browser DOM node whose HTML content was previously generated by React DOM. So I can now attach or I can display these React components in a browser DOM node uh, whose content was previously generated by React DOM server. What is the end goal of this? Hmm? What is the problem Hydratate solve in React? You know, it's like, what in the F is this? <laughs> in React, solve the mismatch between server server rendering HTML and client-side JavaScript interactivity. Let me explain the problem and solution in detail. Server, sir, okay, between server rendering HTML and client-side JavaScript interactivity. The hydration process solves several key problems. Problem, server HTML is static and non-interactive. Mm -hmm. And the solution is hydratation. Attach event handlers and state management without rebuilding the DOM. Interactivity gap, state reconciliation. Initial server state might differ from the client state. Solution, React can conciliate difference and handle state updates smoothly. Performance optimization, full client send Full client-side rendering costs flash or unstyled content. Solution hydration preserves server rendering HTML while adding interactivity. Progressive enhancement. Problem, user might, not, might see non-interactive content before GS load. Basic functionality work before hydration, enhance after, and selected partial hydrations. Problem, not all components need immediate interactivity solution components can be hydrated progressively or on demand but the problem here is common hydration patterns include full page hydration progressive hydration but the problem here streaming hydration would you like me to elaborate of this pattern but the problem here is the mismatch between the server render element html using now react and the client-side JavaScript interactivity. So for example, if you have now a component, function server bottom, that's right, problem one, server render HTML with no interactivity. For example, like this. Uh, and then you have now client-side React component, like this, which is now it has client-side interactivity. A solution, hydration process. It say, hey, let me now call this hydrotate root, identify the root element, okay? And React will preserve the server HTML and attach event listeners and attach the event listeners. Problem to hydratation mismatch. If you, for example, now generating is Time when, ser time when server render. If you're generating is this things with time and they don't match here. Okay, one of the, one of the problem that it solved is this interactivity here. Oh, Jesus, the hydration process is the way of how now React attach interactivity to the DOM. <laughs> it say, hey, let me now find the root elements and then uh, find this particular component and attach interactivity to this, which is here. Oh, and attach the interactivity here without rebuilding the DOM. 
high rotation attach events handlers and state management Hydratation means stage reconciliation. And we can reconciliate difference here. Suppress hydratation warning time. Use suppress hydration warning or use effect for mismatch here. Because at the time that this component is running, uh, right, it rendered all of this, and now at the commit at the end of the commit phase, it's gonna render this use effect. Jesus French those guy. Uh, that it now actually is update the state properly. Progressive bottom, progressive enhancement with hydration. If this is the type window is undefined, server renders basic HTML, right? Client hydrate with React functionality. Okay. With this. Mm -hmm. Progressive enhancement with hydration. But again, this hydration process, so it is okay. So it is safe to assume that hydration, that hydra, hydrate or hydration process is the way of how React provide inter, uh, uh, is the way of how React attach. Uh, interattach a uh, JavaScript functionality from components render in the server to match the client side. Yeah, that's precisely correct. Mm -hmm. So this is the hydro the hydration process is the, is the way of how React attach is JavaScript functionality uh, to React components rendering at the server uh, to match the client side. Jesus, friends, those guys. <laughs> Okay, again, because all of these are generating is on the server. And if these components are generating on the server, um, and if you want is to match that functionality uh, here, uh, this is when it say, hey, let me find the document here. So let me find in the document is that component, and then attach the functionality to that, attach the functionality here. Jesus, it is like pouring water, it is like pouring water, JavaScript interactivity, into existing container, serve HTML, rather than rebuilding the container from scratch. But they say hydrate is because it's going to find that and provide now, or a hydrate and provide this interactivity to that. Mm, but the way to do that is by running is this. Hydrate root. Oh crap. <laughs> this is one of the options of this, right? This is one of the options. Okay, this is test scope. <laughs> oh right, okay, this is test scope. But again, uh, this is not the options that you can go with when you wrap your render function. Okay? As a way to now attach interactivity to this. This may be useful if you're using server-side rendering and use React DOM hydrate to mount your components. The other is wrapper. Pass a React component as the wrapper option to have it rendering around inner element. 
This is most useful for creating reusable custom render functions for common data providers, which is exactly what we want to do this. So custom render like this, okay, uh, where you say, hey, uh, let me now wrap this uh, with this custom data providers, uh, theme providers as well as the children, all right, which is all the providers, and then uh, now what you're going to do is to call that. This is the custom render, and then you get, and then you say this, UI and the wrapper will be now all of this data provider needed to this. This is quite interesting because this is very uh, React specific stuff. Because from the case of Vue, uh, you have now uh, is the same, but you don't have any wrapper for that. You know what it means? This is what happened. You don't have any wrapper for a queries, container, base element, debug, or mount HTML. You don't have any wrapper for this. Uh, exactly. Because again, both of them solve different problems. You have the container, uh, but you don't have the wrapper here. Okay. That's quite interesting. I have this ability to wrap it in a provider, right, mm -hmm. which is just the child at this point. The really cool thing you saw me typing earlier is that React testing library will, if you're using the same wrapper all the time and you don't want to, like, let's say, like, this is one provider. Let's say I had, like, you know that thing where you start out with, like, one context provider, especially if you're using the context API, and next thing you know, you have seven of them, right? Like, could you have put them in over and over and over again? Sure. One of the things I would probably put in the utilities is, like, either wrapper or, like, something called, like, all the providers. Right, and then this wrapper option will then take your component and wrap it in that entire hierarchy so you don't ever really have to, to see that. Um, but the kind of core piece to kind of summarize is my tests were failing because of a problem with my architecture. My problem with my architecture was that my state management and my UI were tightly bound to each other, right? Um, and made it difficult to actually use, um, to use this component, and that manifested itself in the tests. Like I said, this is a small example. Stuff like this has manifested itself in reality, but at that point, it's so like ingrained. And because I don't have the tests sometimes to catch these things early, it's very, very hard to refactor. And that just becomes like, I guess this is us now. I guess this is how we live. Um, and separating out the other thing, and I'm not going to do this all the way because like we're already in the weeds a little bit, and I don't want to be too React specific at this moment. Uh, that I would think about doing, just kind of like some food for thought for later, is like I said, it still has to be wrapped in some kind of provider because you can't take props. So things that I might choose to do later on, um, kind of as my thinking around this, which is like, cool, would I make these um, children? I, I might. Um, a lot of times what I will do is like dependency injection is super powerful, which is um, if you look at like the individual item, for instance, right? Or even the item list, uh, this like use item IDs is a use selector and it needs to be in a provider or else it's a blow up. The trick, you know, in this case is like, what if the ability to fetch stuff from the state was something I passed in, right? If it's something I passed in, now this component can exist outside of a React component hierarchy without a provider. I can pass it in, it will use that hook, and then I can also like provide. pass This is a particular pattern. The idea is like this you're is just trying to like take your code this, base, this is for and this tests. is true in a large application. You're trying to take all the ways that it's like jammed together, um, and start to pull it so you can pass stuff in and you can kind of pull it apart and snap it together rather than the fact that pieces are like glued to each other. And like, mm -hmm. I just to be totally honest with y'all, like, um, you know, preparing for this, I'm like, oh, I should grab some of these like different functions from my code base and just like pull them out of the large code base and drop them into examples. And I realized that like, I had some work to do on my own code base, right? So I'm like, snap it, true in a large application. You're trying to take all the ways that it's like jammed together um, and start to pull it so you can pass stuff in and you can kind of pull it apart and snap it together rather than the fact that pieces are like glued to each other. And like, I just to be totally honest with y'all, like, um, you know, preparing for this, I'm like, oh, I should grab some of these like different functions from my code base and just like pull them out of the large code base and drop them into examples. And I realized that like, I had some work to do on my own code base, right? Like there were things where I couldn't just lift this like data transformation function because it had a bunch of imports that were then kind of like tied to other files. And next thing you know, it's like you go to grab what you think is one piece and stuck to it are like 14 other files, right? And that is a like sign that maybe things are like problematic, right? I think, uh, you know, the thing that I learned, uh, you know, kind of getting ready for this was that a great litmus test 
for you might think that your code is modular and like, oh yeah, this like thing that takes it from the API to how I want to use it in the UI, it's like it just takes these two things. But now like over time, some of these were not my fault. Uh, some of them were. Uh, oh, someone just like imported some other file, right? Well, that's now in the closure scope, right? So you got to bring that file too, and then that file imports another file. You got three files. And that mm -hmm. one enforces two more. You, got, you know what I mean? And it you get this like network effect where it becomes very difficult. And like it is sometimes take w what you think the most modular part of your code base is, and like try to pull it out and drop it into another folder, and see how much stuff breaks. Right? It's a great way to see did you do this as well as you think you did. Um, but there is you know, you these little things you can you find from the testing, and they also kind of point out some of those breaks. Right? It's a great way to see did you do this as well as you think you did. Do you think? Do you do you do this? Do you do this thing that you, as you think you do? Did you do the thing as you think you do? <laughs> um, but there is, you know, these are the little things you can find from the testing, and they also kind of point out some of those like patterns and ways to structure your code, so you can pull stuff and move it. It becomes easier to refactor. You want to move it to a totally another directory? Cool, it just works. You want to, you know, move it out of the project? Great. You want to pull it into its own library? Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it mm -hmm. also makes your code more testable, right? We, we didn't do that in service of the test. We did it in service of having a more maintainable code base that was highlighted by one of our tests, and we fixed our test along the way. Awesome. That was awesome, by the way. Let's talk a little bit about accessibility. And I think I mentioned this uh, earlier in the course, which is, um, you know, on my team, we care a lot about accessibility. And we thought we were doing the right thing. We didn't realize that our build process was broken. Broken is a strong word. It was issuing warnings that we were, like, had, you know, overwhelmingly, you know, to our credit, mostly accessible. It didn't take a lot to get it into shape. But, like, we had lint issues and around the accessibility stuff that were just swallowed, you know, because they were erring to the console uh, and weren't breaking the build, right? And this is one of those things, which is like we joke that the build process is supposed to stop you on a Friday afternoon when you're lazy, but like even in well-meaning situations, it just didn't know, right? Because like you just didn't think to run it from the command line. A build process that broke would have caught it, right? Um, and so you can do it. There's lots of different ways to do it. Like we have um, in a Svelte app, there's this thing called Svelte Check, which will like tell you. Uh, but you can also have tests. Right, um, and the tests are super interesting because you could also seek to like have some nuance around like what exactly is going on in this case, right? Like, or if we're trying to get certain ones and work through it over time, and like you can start skip, you can start them all with to dos uh, for every component and start to uncheck them over time. I think you get a little more granularity with the uh, kind of program model that comes with unit tests versus some other things, but it all kind of works. But the cool thing what I'm going to show you here, and this goes to like this maintainability over time, and so you don't have this thing where all of a sudden some big government agency wants to use your product and won't because you're not accessible. You can basically say like, hey, our tests will fail if common. Like, yes, you should still go through with a screen reader. Sure, sure, sure. But like our test will fail if we have known violations, right? That is one of those things. The like, automated nature of all these things keep your code base healthy over time. Um, there is a library until you've probably heard before called AX. It's like A capital X E, um, and what you can do with that is basically uh, it'll audit the known checks uh, in just the way you wrote your code. Uh, you said AX was an NPM package. AX is an NPM package. It is also a browser extension. It is lots of things that you can do to kind of do static analysis of your code. In this case, like mm. is that? You mean AX Core. AX Core. Um, <laughs> AX Core. Find AX. Uh, yeah, like so that was probably taken. Um, in this case, we're going to use just AX because we're building a test suite. Again, this is one option. We're currently in the p point of component testing, so I felt like a good. Let's, we can do it in here. Could you do it from your browser-based test? You could. Could you do it like just as a tool that does a static analysis of the entire code base? You also could. Those are a little bit trickier because like the, the Chrome extension, for instance, like you got to be using your browser. Um, the stack analysis a lot of time is an all or nothing, or you have to put comments here. Like I kind of said in the preamble, of this if you were just doing the kind of like, hey, we just found out we're, we got to do this, mm. you can start by like layering the test with a to do and start to slowly get your code base over time where you need to go. Like what strategy is right for you uh, depends mm. on the code base, but like let's look at like one common way to deal with this, and then you can kind of apply it as need be. Um, the kind of like bonus exercise that we kind of just briefly talked about the other day was um, this ability to, you know, if you look at the uh, browser here, I've got like just a, a silly, like all the inputs, um, you know, and they change and stuff like that. Uh, everything's great. And what we want to do is make sure that there are no obvious like violations there. Um, and this is super easy um, to do. And what we want to have happen is like mount the component and like check to see like do we have any violations, right? Mm, and they're gonna um, promote so, is like, this kind of this practices when kind of using this accessibility like, when writing a component. Mm -hmm. And this is I think where this is also super powerful mm -hmm. is like especially for a component test is like if you're building like a design system for instance, 
right? Where you've got these individual components, right? You want to run these checks. Like, you know, a lot of times you work on a design system. Sure, maybe you have Storybook, right? Or something like that. But like, you don't really have an app, right? You have a collection of pieces of user interface and different things. And so the idea that you could have the entire suite of the things and run through them all, render them, and do the accessibility check, have tests that break on every single build, mean that you're going to ship a design system that is accessible. So let's go and we'll pull that in. And we've got this render that we've been using the whole time. Um, and we'll pull in the obstacle course. Like I said, it's just a component in this case. Um, one of the cool things, and again, we're using Vitesse, but Jestax will work just fine, um, is there's a plugin called Jest-Axe that we can use. Um, and we'll pull that in as well. So Jest-Axe. Okay. And it only has two things that it exports. Uh, one is um, expectation, maybe? Axe, which will like run the analysis on the component. Um, and then there's okay. a helpful uh, matcher in this case like that we can you use to no expect to have no violations, right? Um, I think that the same way that just DOM has that slash extend expect, exactly. expect extend, whichever one I did the wrong one the first time I switched it and I'll never remember because you do it once in the code base and it's there the entire time. Uh, we can go peek at some point, uh, literally, uh, instead of actually. But like you can also do it globally as well, um, but like depending on what you have, we'll just do it the, uh, the old fashioned way. Expect, and then we can extend exactly. that. And extend I point from. this out because also, if there are common things that you want better at message support, you could write your own, like additional matchers that are unique to your code base as well. If there's like something you've commonly this is find additional yourself doing, matchers given the data to structure have. that you have, or something, it's really hard to invent fake versions of why you would need it. But like, if there's some repeated thing you want to actually have, expect, and then some very unique to your in this file, you I want to do, do this, and we'll give it the to have no violations, right? So now that is available as well. Um, render has a lot of things when we saw when we were playing with the types. You can actually uh, get the like container, you can get the actual result, the base element, so on and so forth. Let's in this case we'll grab the container. I could also probably grab the entire screen too now that I think about it, but we haven't done this one yet, so let's uh let's take a look. Count tainer. Count. I love TypeScript. The fact that I got red squiggly line and I didn't find out that it was undefined later is the best thing. Like when we, the number of times that has saved me is making a silly mistake. Um, it's been super helpful. And then the results is uh, access return a promise. I'm going to make this an async function. And okay. so we can basically take this you know, DOM, really, this DOM. and pass it in and say, cool, like, go ahead and. Uh, oh, OK. So you're going to perform like, this evaluation. Your like, where yeah. have I made boo boos? Right? Uh, and this one I think is actually fine, much to my surprise. Uh, but we'll go and create an issue in a second as well. And then basically, all you need to do at this point. Expect result to have, have no, no violations. violations. Maybe we'll even spell result right. And we won't put a dot at the end. And then you want to run right. this test, and now this particular I file. Be able to run this test. On this. And let's see. Oh, expected. Oh, no, wait. Oh, wait. That's why you like live code in front of people. Because uh, then they catch errors for you. It's like pair programming, but like even bigger. So in this case, like we have no violations. So like, let's go create one just for funsies. Uh, <laughs> different versions of fun for different people. Undefined violation for this specific. Like anything that breaks one of the heuristics. Like the one that, like the one that I, I'm going to do the one that I accidentally do all the time, <laughs> which is uh, a input with no label or forgetting like the HTML for or something along those lines, right? That would be like, hey, you know, the screen reader is not going to be able to read this. Baseline, I don't know if yeah. you can configure what mm -hmm. rule set you can use. I don't know because I usually use the standard one. I would imagine you like could or should be able to. One AA versus double triple A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, triple yeah. A is I think the one we're aiming for. Yeah. Uh, which I, like this will get you most of the way there. You should still be testing with a screen reader and stuff like that as well. Um, cool. And so let's go ahead. Let's just go in to the index.tsx and we'll go and we'll just like I don't know, we'll give ourselves a bonus. Uh, you know what? Go ahead and like here, you know, I was like, yeah, I'll just make an input field. We'll type, I'll have it on change. Everything's great. Life will go on. Code, 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 code. Moving along, right? Um, we can go in here. Yeah, because you see that. DSH, I'll grab the right one. We'll see in a second. It's interesting that that one passes uh, for reasons I don't totally understand. Um, because that's part of the earlier reset. Let's toss it. So that one, for some reason. Oh, I have a label. You just put that back. Oh, I put it back. 
Uh, but here we have an input field um, where we did, in fact, like, uh, have, like, the browser couldn't figure it out. It could have been the form tag. Or maybe we weren't in the form tag. Unclear exactly why that one did work, but it did pass the test. But, like, in this case, just having one um, that didn't have one got me to the point where, like, it gives you basically here were your issues. And you can see there's a long list of things. Like, I wonder if I accidentally, like, appeased one of these in the implementation. But the nice part is, like, this is not a, like, pri if you don't have tooling like this, it becomes an issue of like hoping that someone catches that one input field in a code review. And if you are a good person and you have tiny little PRs that are hyper focused mm -hmm. on one thing, then maybe that code review will work for you. Mm -hmm. If you have that one where you're apologizing to your teammates during standup for the size of the PR because it's 47 files and 3,000 lines of code, the chance that you're going to miss one of these is pretty strong. The best part about this is because it's built into our unit test process. We already exactly. have that built It's building into we'll your building build. process. You get immediate into your feedback. There. Right. And we'll Safe look at ways process. that you can get immediate feedback before you even get to the build process uh, a little bit later. But the idea is like we're building the systems that help us make good choices. Because like I said, I have a team that deeply cares about this, and we messed up. Because I didn't even realize. You know, the issue was like absence of a, you know, the passing doesn't necessarily mean that things are good. It just means that like we weren't blowing up the build because of an accident. Um, lots of things were probably not the build, just not that. Uh, and so kind of verifying these things and like building these systems, like we'll never have the issue again because the build will break uh, mm -hmm. if it ever comes up again. Mm -hmm. That's quite interesting. But again, that's beyond the scope of today's video. Take care. Bye-bye.